Hey you guys, what's up? Welcome back to my channel. So if you've never seen me before, my name is Chelsea and I write books about black girls who aren't all that nice. And on the side, sometimes I read books. And we are here to talk about one that I really enjoyed recently and that is Delicious Monsters. So if you guys have been on the channel, then you'll know by now that I have had the chance to talk with Lizelle. She had a whole interview with the Written and Melanin podcast, which is on the channel somewhere. And you can listen to the full conversation either on my Patreon, which you can sign up for $5 gets you in, or you can listen to it on the podcast, which is absolutely free. So get into it, whichever way makes you feel happy. And this is my actual review of the book. And I wanted to hold off on giving my thoughts until I had a chance to talk to Lizelle because I don't know, I feel like I'm just one of those people where I'm like, you know, talk to the author, listen to what they have to say about the book, and then I'll give you my opinions on it type thing. That's just me. But I digress. Here we are. So Delicious Monsters. By now, you guys probably know that I absolutely adored this book. I thought it was great. I thought it was amazing. So if you're one of those people who are like, I'm just here to get the review. It's a five star read for me. And I'm definitely going to be breaking down why. And just like I did with the last time I did this, and I talked about uh, the wrong kind of weird um, with Delicious Monsters, I'm going to be talking about this from the perspective of an author because I am an author and I really can't divorce my brain from author Chelsea and reader Chelsea anymore. So that in mind, let's go ahead and get into this. So for starters, let's get into some of these details for you bookish folks who are like, you just want the rundown of the book. So the title of the book is Delicious Monsters. The author is Lazelle Sanberry. It is published by Simon & Schuster, and it came out February 28th of 2023. It is a young adult book, so an audience for 14 and up. And it is a psychological thriller slash horror. So keep that in mind because this is about a haunted house and the main character does see dead people. So the I had the paperback version because I got an arc. So I know the actual version of the book that's available right now is in the hardback version. But the one that I have is the page count is 512 pages. So if you want to know how long the book, how long the book is, it's around there. Um, content warnings, I will post them on screen, but in case you're just listening to this, a quick runoff of them are, you have childhood sexual assault, which is off page, some childhood physical abuse, which is corporal punishment off page. Uh, also there is some confinement punishment, childhood neglect, gaslighting, grooming, suicide off page, but there is mention of it, killing of a goat off page, but it is described discussions of fat phobia, body horror and gore, violence and death. So that being said, I will say this as far as the content warnings, um, none of these are personally triggers for me. So take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt, but I do think that the book handled it really well. So um, if this these are triggers for you, obviously move accordingly. But if you are like, these aren't personal triggers for me, but I'm not sure if I want to read a book with these things in it, um, it is handled really well. It is handled with delicacy and it is not something personally that I felt was overwhelming or took away from the story. It's just part of the history and the backstory of some of these characters that are in the book. So um, that being said, like I said, um, I thought this book was honestly like phenomenal. I thought it was amazing. I thought it was great. Um, and it did pretty much everything right for me. And the way that I'm set up, I'm hypercritical of books, which is why I normally don't get on the internet and talk about them because I'm like, one thing I'm not going to do is get on the internet and tear a black author down. Right. But if I don't like the book, then okay, cool. I didn't like the book. But by that same token, I also don't generally get on the internet to be like, oh, I really absolutely love this book because for me, there's usually something that can always be improved. But I will say this, Delicious Monsters for me did pretty much everything right that I wanted in a book like this. So it's definitely one that I think that, you know, other authors can read and take something from. And if you enjoy psychological thrillers, if you enjoy horror, if you enjoy haunted houses, if you enjoy anything with like a slightly darker, creepier edge to it, I think that you would really enjoy this book because um, if you are, again, new to the channel, new to me and the kind of content I do, I am not really a horror girly. Like that is not my bag. <laughs> I don't enjoy being scared for fun. Um, but this isn't necessarily scary. I think it's more like it's got a creepy vibe to it. And there's definitely some like, oh, snap moments in the book. But it's nothing that's like, it, it didn't give me nightmares. Let me put it like that. So 
Um, take that for what you will. All that being said, let's get into this, what I felt like I learned from it as an author. There are five main things that I really kind of want to talk about. And the first one is the suspense in the book. So this book is a great example of how to keep your readers turning pages with just enough answers to the questions to remain invested without feeling like you're truly being like strung along. And the reason I say that is because like, as you're reading it, the book is told in two perspectives. So you have Daisy, who's the main character. She is 17 and she can see ghosts. And this is not something that she enjoys. <laughs> it's something that she's like, I hate this. And she has a really complicated relationship with her mom. And from the very beginning of the book, you know that there is this house that has been inherited. And basically her mom leaves it up to her and she's like, hey, do you want to go live in the mansion or not? And Daisy being 17 and like knowing nothing about this mansion or anything is like, uh, yeah, let's go. And that's kind of where the story takes off. And I really loved that as you're going along, you know that, you know, her mom is keeping secrets. You know that the way Daisy has perceived things that has happened to her is not necessarily the way she's remembering them, if that makes sense. Like she's coming to terms with some of the things that have happened and how she perceives people. And then as as the story goes along, you're getting more questions and, you know, you get answers as well, but like, it's kind of like that saying like one step forward, two steps back, except in this case, it's like one question, one question answered, two questions gained, you know, if that makes sense. And it's a really good pace because you never feel overwhelmed as the reader, like, oh, okay, there are way too many questions. I have no answers. I'm confused about what's going on. What are we focusing on? It's always like, okay, we have the answer to this question, but now we have like three more questions to take place. And you want to know what those questions are and they're well placed throughout the story. And I, I loved it. Like I ate this book up and normally I am the type of person where I'm just kind of like, yeah, my attention span, the way it's set up, if a book is not really interesting, I don't finish it. Hence what I said at the beginning of this, where I'm not reading a whole lot of books like that, because a lot of books in this current big old age of 2023 just do not hold my attention the way that it needs to be held in order for me to read something from start to finish. So for me to not only be invested in this story, but also like actively thinking about it when I'm not reading it and trying to like actively make time to sit down and get through the book and figure out what's going to happen next. I feel like that is a really good indicator, at least for me, at least for the people who know me, right? Like I, I was, I was locked in y'all for real. And I got to a point where I was just like, wow, I really don't want to finish this book because when I finish this book, I'm going to have to find another one. And I know that it's going to be a while before I find another book that is going to satisfy me like this one is. But I digress back to the point. The suspense is great. So if you're looking for a book like as an author to read where you're like, oh, my pacing is off and I know that I want to tell the story and you're like, OK, let me see somebody who does it well. I think Delicious Monsters is that book. I think Delicious Monsters is a really good resource if you want to see how the author keeps readers invested enough. Um, that being said, I think the other thing that really uh gives weight to this book is the complexity of the characters. So every single character had layers to them and no one was perfect and everyone made mistakes, which again is believable. And I think for me, for me, right? All of this is opinion, but I have feel like I should restate that this is an opinion. For me, a lot of times when I read books, I feel like the characters are too perfect or they are making mistakes just for the sake of making mistakes to push along the plot. They don't feel as if the character is making those mistakes organically. They feel very manufactured and I don't like characters like that. I don't like perfect characters and I don't like manufactured mistakes. And for me, when I'm reading a story, if I feel like a character is just making a mistake because that is what the plot needs to move forward or this is what needs to happen in order for, you know, a third act breakup to happen or for strain to be put on this relationship when it's like that's very unrealistic for this character, I don't like it. And so what I loved about Delicious Monsters is every character, everything that they did had meaning behind it and it fit with who you were discovering this character to be along the journey. So when you meet uh, Daisy, she's just like 
this, she's just this girl and she's like trying to deal with the fact that her boyfriend is no longer talking to her and she's going through all these inner emotions and so like when she gets to the point where she's making some of her decisions you have been on this journey with her long enough to understand that this is not out of the norm like this is a linear <laughs> a linear thought process you know it's not like sure is she being emotional is she being dramatic yeah but also like she's 17 and you know she's dealing with things that are overwhelming for her and so her reactions to it feel organic and I really like that and it's not just Daisy Brittany was that way who is the other character in the book who we get her perspective from 10 years in the future and she's running a YouTube channel and basi basically she is researching, not researching, she's doing a documentary on the house and forgotten black girls and Daisy is one of those girls and you kind of go through the story trying to figure out, you know, what's real and what's the truth because obviously we're getting Daisy's perspective and like I said, she's complex, she's a teenager, she has her own, her own thoughts, she has her own ways that she perceives the world and what's happening to her. And then you have Brittany's perspective, which is 10 years in the future, and she's doing a documentary and talking to the people who knew Daisy and knew her mom and knew their situation from the outside and forming her own conclusions of what happened. And so it's kind of like you, Bill, as the reader, you get this kind of duality of what is the truth? What is actually what happened? And I feel like it replicates this feeling that you actually have in life where it's just like, you know, there are always multiple versions of the truth, as they like to say. You know, facts are facts, obviously, but there are always going to be ways that people perceive things differently. And I think this book really captured that. And by doing it, it makes everything about the book more complex and not complex as in confusing or complex as in hard to understand, but complex as in there are always multiple parts moving. So even when Daisy is perceiving something some, one way, you can understand how other people are perceiving it differently. And I really like that aspect because all of the characters were layered in that way. So Daisy, Brittany, uh, King, who is her neighbor when she moves to the mansion, you know, when her mom, her name is Grace and, you know, all the people that she interacts with there, every character has layers and secrets and ways that they act that are motivated by things that you see and understand on the page that makes you create questions for them. That kind of leads back to what I said before, the suspense of wanting to find out more. It's just, it's extremely well done. And it's the kind of story that makes me happy. It's the kind of story where it's just like, yeah, this felt like, this, these could be real people. And honestly, if a book doesn't do that, I don't want to read it. <laughs> I don't want to read it at this point. It's just like, I want to feel like these people are real. I want to feel like they have their own motivations for doing things. And I loved that this book included that. So that being said, um, one of my favorite aspects of this book was that the characters never gave away too much and they left things unsaid, which honestly, as an editing coach, as an author mentor, as someone who is very fortunate to be in a place where I can offer advice to new writers and writers who want to improve their craft, this is the biggest aspect of character development and dialogue that I think a lot of people need to understand is that not everyone says everything that they mean all the time. No one is always willingly giving away their secrets. And I love that in Delicious Monsters, people walked away from conversations. They left thing things unsaid. They were not hounding the main character like, oh, I want to be friends with you because you're main character. Daisy did not necessarily have main character powers. And I really appreciated that because it's just like she made some people upset. Her mom didn't come through and miraculously just have a turnaround of personality because Daisy got upset. And, you know, the people that she was around and people that she was trying to make friends with, you know, they treated her according to how she treated them, you know, and and not everyone was forthcoming with every secret. You know, Daisy had to ask questions and she had to figure out things on her own. And I feel like that is such a powerful lesson for a lot of authors that I wish more people understood. It's just like every conversation does not need to be revealing in the sense of 
this conversation is now unnatural because you as the author need to reveal information to the reader and you have no other way to do it but in conversation. And Delicious Monsters, I feel like in its own way is a masterclass of like how to just have two characters have a conversation that is appropriate for them and also push the plot and also, you know, give the characters depth and also, you know, give more information to the reader without it being heavy handed and obvious. I really enjoyed that aspect of it. And because they left things unsaid, I feel like it led to point number three that I want to talk about that I really enjoyed is the inevitable. Um, what Delicious Monsters does, you know, it is a book about a haunted house. So at the very beginning, you know, Daisy and her mom, they're living in the city and they ultimately move to the haunted house. And that's not a spoiler. It's something that you can read in the back of the book, right? What I loved about The Inevitable was that even knowing that the house was haunted and that it was going to cause Daisy strife, as you're reading through her story, as you're reading through what's happening, you want her to choose to go to this house. You want her to make this decision because it is written in such a way that even though it's inevitable, you want this thing to happen. And I found that to be amazing. Like if for me as an author... I feel like that is one of the biggest things that I took away from this reading this book is the fact that there is this aspect of, yes, there is a plot, but this book is woven together in such a way that even after you read the summary and even knowing that the house that Daisy is going to is going to be haunted and like cause her all of this pain, you still want her to go to the house. You still want her to choose herself. You still want her to have this level of, of confidence and determination to make this decision because of what she's going through at that time. And to create a situation in a book like this, where as the reader, you already know what's coming and you still want it to happen because you think it's what's best for the character. That to me is amazing. That to me is skill. That to me is something worth noticing. And even if you don't, even if you don't read the whole book, which I highly recommend that you do, because I feel like if you get into it and you like it, you're definitely going to want to finish it. But even if you don't read the whole book, I would even argue that you should just read the beginning to see how uh, Lazelle Sanberry crafts this aspect of the book where it's just like, yeah, this is a terrible idea. I know it's a terrible idea, but I still think you should make this decision. And it's amazing. If y'all hear my husband sneezing in the background, I am so sorry. He sneezes so loud. <laughs> but <laughs> that being said, there were two more points to this book that I thought were exceptionally well done. And that is the voice of the book, um, meaning the voice of the characters. Um, they were clear and appropriate for their ages, how they lived and who they were. So it's hard to do that, but this one, it felt seamless. Um, especially when you're writing a book with two teenage girls, it's very easy to make them sound the same. So I loved, loved, loved that both Brittany and Daisy had differing voices. You know, Daisy was a lot more like chill and reserved and like I'm just minding my business trying to get through things and Brittany was a much bigger personality where she was like no we have to find out the truth and they both have very complex and layered relationships with their mothers that are not necessarily all positive but even so, they have developed from those relationships in different ways, even though they had to endure some of the same things. And I find that to go back to what I said earlier about the complexity of the characters is the fact that, yes, even though they experienced some of the same things, they turned out to be completely different people. Um, I also like that Brittany is 19 and Daisy is 17. So they're 10 years apart. So technically in the timeline of things, Daisy is older than Brittany. But when you're reading them, you know, Daisy is a little bit younger. And so the way that they perceive things and go about things is appropriate for where they're at in their lives. And I just, I really appreciated that. Um, and that being said, that leads into the fifth thing that I appreciated was the dual point of view. Um, there were more chapters in Daisy's perspective than Brittany's, but I felt like they were perfectly placed. And I wanted to bring this up because as an author, one of the things when it comes to writing multiple points of view, um, the generally accepted unwritten rule is that you kind of want those perspectives to be evenly balanced or very close to it. So it's not like if you have 20 chapters, you want 18 of them to be in one person's perspective and then two of them to be in someone else's. You kind of want them to be 
organized in such a way where it's just kind of like, yeah, it, there's a balance to it. But what I really, really enjoyed about Delicious Monsters is that there wasn't. Like, Britney's perspectives comes up when it's necessary and when it adds more to the story. And personally, I loved it. I love that we got to spend most of our time with Daisy because as the reader, that's who I wanted to be with. That's whose perspective I wanted to be in. That is who I wanted to know more information from. So I'm really glad that reading this, you, that's what you got. You got mostly Daisy's perspective. And then when you needed perspective, when you needed a reminder of what's happening and you needed um, an outside perspective, so you don't get caught up completely in Daisy's head. You had Brittany and it was perfectly placed every single time. You had Brittany come and she's asking questions of other people that are interacting with Daisy. And so you get like how they're perceiving things and how they perceive Daisy and how they perceive her mom, Grace, and how they perceive the house and how they perceive the history of the house and everything else because it's a small town, right? Everyone knows everything. And, you know, when you have Brittany asking these questions and getting into these other people's minds it kind of colors the picture a little bit differently than what Daisy is telling you and I just thought it was I thought it was well done and I also think it's something that more authors should do because I feel like there are definitely rules to writing that should be followed and I think it's very important to know the rules of writing before you try to break them but I also think it's really important to go with what feels right for the story. And I think a lot of times um, authors follow the rules, even if that's not what's necessarily best for them. So that's kind of my thoughts on Delicious Monsters. Like I said, I thought this book was excellent. I thought it was amazing. I thought it was really exceptionally well written. I kept me glued to the pages from start to finish. And it's definitely one that I would highly recommend to anyone who enjoys, like I said, haunted houses, thrillers, horrors, anything of that nature. If you are looking for like, not a hefty read, but like one that's going to like keep you invested for the time being and give you like kind of creepy vibes, absolutely pick up this book. Um, I definitely hope more people read it because I hope Lizelle gets to write more books like this in this, in this vein, in this realm, because like I said, I thought it was great. I thought it was amazing. And I will definitely be giving a chance, you know, her other works, in the thriller psychological thriller realm I thought I thought it was that good I thought it was that good so that is my perspective on all of this if you have read delicious monsters feel free to comment down below and let me know what you thought about it if you loved it if you didn't like it all I ask is that you be respectful and to share your opinion but yeah if you haven't read the book and you do want to read it let me know that too and if you have nothing else to say you could just drop a brown heart in the comments and yeah that's it. Thank you guys for watching all the way to the end of this video. I appreciate you. Um, I don't have an actual outro for this, so I'm just going to leave it at. There are links to everything that I do down in the description box below. If you are interested in my editing or coaching services, there are links to that. And if you'd like to submit a book to the Melanin Library, then head to melaninlibrary.com. And if you'd like to support me in anything that I do, um, feel free to check out my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash cmlockhart or patreon.com forward slash written in melanin. But yeah, that's it. So until next time, you guys, I hope your days are lovely and your books are interesting. Bye.